good afternoon again. Uh, we reached the final keynote of the conference, and now I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Yohane Palazma. Yohane Palazma is a Finnish architect, as an exhibition designer, writer, teacher, and practicing architect. As director of the Museum of Finnish Architecture from 1978 to 1983, he was germane in internationalizing the, its art activities and exhibiting over a decade ago the works of such architects as Tado Ando, Alvaro Siza, and Daniel Leveskin, who only later became renowned throughout the world. He runs his own architect's office in Helsinki. Palazma became universally known through his lectures and books on architectural theory and his interest in phenomenology. In his widely read 1996 book, book The Eyes of the Skin, Architect, Architecture and the Senses, he stresses the importance of experience in architectural production, which today is neglected by most practitioners. During the course of his career, he has also served as state artist professor director of the Museum of Finnish Architecture, associate professor at the Haile Selassie University, Addis Ababa, director of the exhibition department at the Museum of Finnish Architecture, and rector of the College of Ch Crafts and Design. He is currently the Ruth Norman Moore visiting professor at Washington University in San Luis, US, as well as the current flying professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in Champa Champaign, Illinois. Joanna Palazma is currently a member of the Pritzker Prize Award Jury. I would like to invite Joanna Palazma for a speech titled The Existential Dimensions in Architecture. The stage is yours, Mr. Palazma. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have had a very busy day. I just, do you hear me? I just finished a jury in Turkey 10 minutes ago. Yes, we, are, we hear you. Okay, good. Uh, so I will re re read my title because I uh, added a subtitle, The Existential Dimension in Architecture, The Mental Reality of uh, Art. Modern architectural theory, education and practice have regarded architecture as visually idealized and aestheticized spaces, material structures and forms, and have primarily studied the historical, functional, technical and formal characteristics. These analyses have focused on architecture as physical objects and spaces and their geometric and compositional qualities, as well as the representation of these properties in drawings and conceptual schemes. As architecture does not possess a comprehensive theory of its own, the approach and method of uh, research have uh, usually been borrowed from other disciplines in accordance with changing interests and fashions. Often the applicability of the chosen theoretical frameworks has been questionable in the specific embodied reality of architecture. As for instance, in the case of linguistic and deconstructionist theories. Subtitle, Architecture and Scientific Criteria. Although I am frequently introduced as a theoretician, I dare to question the feasibility of a comprehensive theory of architecture due to the inherent internal complexities, contradictions, and irreconcilabilities of this phenomenon. Through their relative artistic autonomy and focus, the fine arts are fundamentally less complex and contradictory in their ontological grounding than architecture. The inherent internal complexity of architecture projects 
architectural projects was pointed out by my great countryman Alvar Aalto in his inaugural lecture as member of the Academy of Finland in 1955. Quote, whatever our task, whether large or small, in every case, opposites must be reconciled. Almost every formal assignment involves dozens, often hundreds, sometimes thousands of conflicting elements that can be forced into functional harmony only by an act of will. This harmony cannot be achieved by any other means than art. The value, the final value of individual technical and mechanical elements can only be assessed, assessed afterwards. A harmonious result cannot be achieved with mathematics, statistics, or probability calculus. End of uh, Alto quote. Alto's declaration 60 years ago of the supremacy of art uh, over science was a courageous statement. Uh, Alto's view of the integrating power of art has recently been supported by um, Vittorio Gallese, one of the discoverers of the mi mirror neurons 30 years ago. Quote, from a certain point of view, art is more powerful than science. With much less expensive tools and with greater power of synthesis, artistic intuitions show us who we are, probably in a much more exhaustive way with respect to the more objectifying approach of the natural sciences. Being human squares with the ability to ask ourselves who we are. Since the, be the beginning of mankind, artistic creativity has expressed such ability in its purest and highest form. End of quote. This is the view of a humanist scientist. The inherently unscientific nature of architecture arises from the fact that it is practiced, uh, that its practice fuses facts and dreams, knowledge and beliefs, rationality and emotion, technology and artistic expression, intelligence and intuition, as well as the temporal dimensions of past, present, and future. Besides, it is simultaneously the means and the end, a means to achieve its utilitarian and practical purpose, and an end as an artistic manifestation that mediates experiential, cultural, mental, and emotional qualities and values. In short, architecture is conceptually too impure or messy as a phenomenon of human activity uh, to, to be logically structured within a single theory. A theory of architecture sounds to me as impossible and ultimately as useless as uh, a theory of life would be. As a consequence of its complexity, architecture is bound to arise from an interact, uh, iterative and embodied action that fuses rationality and feeling, analysis and synthesis, knowledge and intuition, empathy and imagination, rather than from an inclusive theory and fully rational aspect, uh, 
sorry, and fully rationalized processes. There can well be theory-based and fully rational aspects in the design process, but in its entirety, the process is iteratively synthetic. Architectural design as a creative process in general is guided by a subjective and mostly subconscious self-piloting self -pil action uh, and an immersive embodied identification with the concrete task that fuses aspects of the irreconcilable categories rather than the application of a theory-based, rational, methodical, and predictable procedure. Let me repeat again. The design process is not a rational path as it consists of countless repeated deviations. Um, dead ends, new beginnings, hesitations, temporary certainties, and a gradual emergence of an acceptable goal as a result of the process itself. The structure and potential essence of the design task is gradually revealed as the design response emerges. The questions and answers are formulated simultaneously, and both are subject to the uh, unpredictabilities of the creative process. Simply due to the essential existential content of architecture, its design cannot be a smooth, rational problem-solving process all buildings that move us are usually closer to personal confessions than problem solving. And the most inspiring architectural texts are uh, often personal poetic evocations rather than results uh, of uh, scientific research or proofs. Next chapter title, The Poetic and Phenomenological Approach. The phenomenon of architecture has also been approached through subjective and personal encounters in a poetic, aphoristic, or essayistic manner, as in the writings of many of the leading architects from Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier to Alvar Aalto and Louis Kahn and further to Stephen Hall and Peter Zumto. In these writings, architecture is approached in a poetic and metaphorical manner without any ambitions or qualifications as scientific research. These writings usually arise from personal experiences, observations, and beliefs, and they approach architecture as a poetic experience and projection of life, and their ambition is to be experientially true. I must personally confess that these personal and often confessional accounts have valorized the holistic, existential, uh, and poetic essence of architecture to me more than any theoretical or empirical studies that claim to satisfy the criteria of science. Historically, there are four categories of seeking meaning in human existence myth or religion, science, uh, and art, and uh, a fourth one, the uh, lived world. And these 
uh, four endeavors are fundamentally incomparable with each other. So in architecture, we are dealing with four realities. The first is based on faith, the second on knowledge, and the third on existential and emotive ex experience, and the fourth on uh, lived life. The poetic, experiential, and existential core of art and architecture has to be confronted, lived, and felt rather than understood or formalized intellectually. There are surely numerous aspects of in construction in its performance, structural reality, as well as formal and dimensional properties, as well as distinct psychological uh, impacts that can be studied scientifically. But the experiential, mental and existential meaning of the entity can only be encountered and experienced or imagined. During the past few decades, an experiential approach based on phenomenological encounters and first person experiences of buildings and settings has gained ground. This thinking is initially based on the philosophies of Edmund Husserl, Martin Heidegger, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, Gaston Bachelard, and many other philosophical thinkers. The phenomenological approach, which also acknowledges the significant role of embodiment was introduced into the architectural context by such writers as Sten Eiler Rasmussen, Christian Norberg Schultz, Charles Moore, David Simon, Robert Mugerauer, and Karsten Harris, for instance. I also believe that the book Questions of Perception of 1994 by Stephen Hall, Alberto Perez Gomez, and myself helped to spread this manner of thinking, especially in schools of architecture internationally. And the next subtitle, The Meaning of Experience. The poetic and existential dimension of architecture is a mental quality. And this artistic and um, experiential essence of architecture emerges in the individual encounter with an experience of the work. In the beginning of his seminal book, Art as, uh, Art as Experience of 1934, John Dewey, the visionary American pragma pragmatist philosopher argues, quote, in common conception, the work of art is often identified with the building, book, painting, or statue in, ex in its existence apart from human experience. Since the actual work of art is what the product does with and in experience, the result is not favorable to understanding. When artistic objects are separated from both conditions of origin and operation in experience, experience a wall is built around them that renders almost opaque the general significance with which aesthetic theory deals." End of quote. John Dewey quote. Uh, here, the philosopher um, connects the condition of making a piece of art and its later encounter by someone else as in both cases, the mental and experiential reality dominates and the work 
exists nakedly as a human experience. The philosopher suggests that the difficulties in understanding artistic phenomena arise from the tradition of studying them as objects outside of human uh, experience and consciousness. Dewey writes further, quote, by common consent, the Parthenon is a great work of art, yet it has aesthetic standing only as the work becomes an experience for a human being. Art is always the product in experience of an interaction of human beings with their environment. Architecture is a notable instance of the reciprocity of the results in this interaction. The reshaping of sub subsequent experience by architectural works is more direct and more extensive than in the case of any other arts. They not only influence the future, but they record and convey the past. End of uh, Dewey quote. Here Dewey even assigns an actively conditioning role to architecture in relation to the nature of experience itself, as well as to our understanding of the passing of time and history. I have formulated this view with the argument that architecture creates frames and horizons for perception, experience and understanding the human condition. And consequently, instead of being the end product, it has essentially a mediating role. The next uh, chapter heading, time in architectural experience. The significance of the time dimension and temporal experience has not usually been sufficiently acknowledged in studies of architecture. Karsten Harris is who's a philosopher at uh, Yale University. His statement on the mental meaning of time in architecture is significant. Quote, architecture is not only about domesticating space, it is also a deep defense against the terror of time. The language of beauty is essentially, <coughs> sorry, the language of timeless reality, end of quote. Since Siegfried Gideon's uh, book, Space, Time and Architecture, the art of building has been theorized in terms of the space-time continuum as defined in modern physics. But the dimension of time has also its independent mental role in our experience of life and architecture. We have a deep existential need to feel rooted in time as much as in space. We dwell in both space and time and both dimensions are articulated and domesticated for human purposes by architecture. The significance of experience has been grasped in other art forms such as theater, cinema and music, but it has not been understood in relation to such material and utilitarian objects as buildings and larger environments. Next, next <coughs> excuse me, uh, a subtitle, Encountering Architecture. The experiential approach focuses on the encounter of the architectural reality and the experiencing person and mind. And in accordance with Dewey's view, this actualizes the architectural dimension. The phenomenological method attempts to approach phenomena without preconceptions and to identify with sensitivity and openness the emergence of emotion and meaning in this unique 
personal encounter. Beyond its constitution in, in experience, architecture mediates between the outer world and the inner realm of the self, projecting frames of perception and understanding. This interchange is necessarily an exchange. As I enter a space, the space enters me and changes me. My experience and my self-understanding. Mediation is essential in all arts. And Maurice Merleau-Ponty states firmly, quote, we come to see not the work of art, but the world according to the work, end of quote. The philosopher's view rejects the regrettably common understanding of art and architecture as artistic self-expressions. This is an essential point. The meaning of art and architecture is outside of the work itself, and it always reaches beyond itself. A fundamental starting point in the experiential approach to art and architecture is the fusion or continuum of the physical and the mental, the outer and the inner realms without categoric boundaries. Rainer Maria Rilke used the beautiful notion Welt Innenraum in the endless uh, 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 in the endlessness of the universe, architecture frames our Welt Innenraum, the inner space of the world, our place and domicile uh, in infinity and eternity. Merleau-Ponty tells us enigmatically, quote, the whole world is wholly inside uh, sorry, excuse me, quote, the world is wholly inside and I am wholly outside of myself, unquote. This seems to point that at the chiasmatic intertwining of the outer and the inner realms, the material and the mental, a kind of a Merbius strip, which has two sides, but only one surface. Next chapter is entitled Intuiting Architecture. Profound architects have always intuitively understood that buildings structure, reorient, and attune our mental realities. The fact that artists have intuited mental and neural phenomena often decades before psychology or neuroscience have identified them is the subject matter of Jonah Lehrer's thought-provoking book entitled Proust was a neuroscientist. In his pioneering book, Survival Through Design, published more than six decades ago, Richard Neutra already acknowledges the biological and neurological realities and makes a suggestion that is surprising for its time. Uh, this is a Richard Neutra quote. Our time is characterized by a systematic ri rise of the biological sciences and is, and is turning away from oversimplified and mechanistic views of the 18th and 19th centuries without belittling in any way the temporary good such views may have once delivered. An important result of this new way of regarding this business of living may be to bear and raise appropriate working principles and criteria for design." End of quote. Later he even professed, uh, professed quote, today design may exert 
a, a far reaching influence on the nervous makeup of generations, unquote. Thanks to the electronic instruments such as the MRIF uh, scanner, uh, today, 65 years later, we uh, know that this is the case. Also, Alvar Aalto intuited the biological ground of architecture in his statement, unquote. I would like to add my personal emotional view that architecture and its details are in some way all part of biology, uh, end of quote. The direct Im impact of settings on the human nervous system and brain uh, have been proven by research in today's neuroscience. This, we architects unknowingly operate with neurons and neural connections. This realization heightens the human responsibility in the architect's work. I myself used to see buildings as aestheticized objects, but for, um, for three decades now, architectural images have been primarily mental images or ex experiences of the human condition and mind. I have also gradually understood the significance of the designer's empathic capacity, the gift to simulate and empathize with the experience of the little man, to use Alvaraldo's notion. This interface between the material and the mental worlds is so fundamental that a uh, number of philosophers and neuroscientists such as Alva Noe increasingly see this continuum to constitute the human consciousness. Our consciousness is not located in the brain as it is out there in the relation between our brain and the world. John Dewey argued thought provokingly, quote, the mind is a verb, unquote. I wish to argue that architecture is also a verb as its true essence is always an invitation to action and specific guidance or choreography of that action. It is this verb-like tendency towards active search and exploration that unites architecture and the human mind. Architecture is always also a promise, a pledge, and an offer of human order, predictability and security, both physical and mental. Next subtitle, vision and the existential sense. Until recently, architecture has primarily been seen as a visual art form, experienced and judged by vision. This view is expressed most notably by Le Corbusier in his credo, quote, architecture is the masterly correct and magnificent play of masses brought together in light, end of quote. The hegemony of vision has been pointed out by a number of contemporary thinkers, such as David Michael Levine and Martin Jay. I have also written extensively on the often forceful dominance of vision in the Western industrial <clears throat> and consumerist culture. And I have argued that the directional sense of vision 
makes us observers and outsiders, whereas the omnidirectional embracing senses of hearing, touch, smell, and even taste turn us into insiders and participants. We can also suspect that the unfocused peripheral vision is more important than focused vision for the experience of being in space or the sense of participation and belonging. Already Walter Benjamin argued that architecture along with cinema is primarily a tactile art form. Merleau-Ponty finally brought all the senses together in his understanding of sensory perception. Quote, my perception is not a sum of visual, tactile and audible givens. I perceive in a total way with my whole being. I grasp a unique structure of the things, a unique way of being, which speaks to all my senses at once. End of Merleau-Ponty quote. Yes, we sense by means of our very existence. After having investigated the phenomenon of architecture for 60 years, as an architect, a writer, and teacher, I have no hesitation in arguing today that our most important sense in architectural experience is not vision, but our extended haptic sense, the existential sense, our sense of bodily being and self. Architecture is primarily an experience of our embodied sense of being, of our experience of being in the world, rather than merely a vision or any other of the five Aristotelian senses in, in separation. In Merleau-Ponty's statement above, his expression, quote, I perceive with my whole being, unquote, seems to suggest such an embodied and unified existential experience. It is becoming evident that we encounter and judge environments and architecture through our most synthetic sense, our sense of being and self. Merleau-Ponty's notion of, quote, the flesh of the world, unquote, makes this view understandable. Quote, our own body is in the world as the heart is in the organism. It keeps the visible spectacle constantly uh, alive. It breathes life into it and sustains it inwardly. And with it forms a system. We exist, uh, end of uh, Merleau-Ponty quote, we exist in this flesh of the world and grasp our existence through being part of that very flesh. Merleau-Ponty suggests poetically that Paul Cezanne's paintings, quote, make us feel how the world touches us, unquote. I wish to add that architecture goes even a step further as it enables us to dwell in the flesh of the world itself, not only touching it. Architecture gives us our domicile in this existential flesh, both physically and mentally. Architecture also activates and strengthens our sense of self as its experience is always individual, contextual, and unique. Art and architecture seem to be always addressing each one of us individually. This is a consequence of John Dewey's suggestion that the work of art is always an individual creation 
in experience. Besides, if I am unable to project meaning into my encounter with a place, space or building, there is really no architecture, just the physical constructs, construction of the setting. This is a non-place to use the notion of Edward Relf. The imaginative experience of the spaces and events experienced when reading a novel is a most impressive capacity of our imaginative minds. While reading, we keep constructing objects, rooms, houses, cities, and entire continents. And even more miraculously, we create the flesh in which these events are embedded. We architects should study how great writers make us not only enter li literary realities, but construct them in our imagination. We need to learn to see, imagine and feel drawings as experienced and lived, but that calls for a capacity of imagination elevated to second power. As Jean-Paul Sartre argues, when I am reading Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, I project my own sense of frustration, frustrated waiting on the character of Raskolnikov. The next chapter, perception, experience and imagination. Perceptions are not experiences as they are mere registrations of stimuli without contextualization, judgment, and meaning. Sense perceptions interact with memory and imagination to constitute a full integrated experience with distinct connections and meanings. In architectural design work, the most demanding and valuable skill is to intuit or simulate the experience of the physically non-existent entity. Again, intuiting the experience of a single form or object is relatively easy. Whereas imagining the entire atmosphere or feeling of a wide and complex spatial uh, entity calls for extraordinary imaginative skills. The imaginative and in intuitive experience calls for the capacity of empathy. The notion of empathy was introduced in the aesthetic theories of late 19th century, but it has been bypassed during the entire modern era. However, along with the current interest in experience, also the interest in empathy is now emerging. And in my view, it should be taught in architecture schools. It is not enough to imagine your own feeling as you need to imagine the experience and feeling of the other. It has taken so long to realize how we actually experience the world and architecture as a part of it because we have been misguided by the view of our, lie, of our five separate senses as defined by Aristotle. We can point an organic physiological sense organ for each one of our five classical senses, whereas we cannot point an organ for our atmospheric experience existential sense or sense of being as they all arise from a synthetic understanding of being in the world. Even the blind and the deaf are able to experience their full embodied existence. However, 
Steinerian philosophy categorizes 12 senses, and one of them is the ego sense, the sense of self. The Steinerian thinking also identifies a life sense, a self movement sense, and in my view, these three non Aristotelian senses together constitute the exist uh, existential sense through which architecture is primarily experienced. Besides the received understanding of the functioning of the senses seems to simplistic, simplistic and in the light of recent studies often entirely wrong. But discussing this subject would take me too far from the focus of my lecture. The cardinal mistake is the prevailing understanding of our experience of the world as a picture. It suffices here to just mention that philosopher Alva Noe presents the dramatic question, is the visual world a grand illusion? In the very title of a book, he has edited. This is a shocking question for us architects to think about. And my last chapter is entitled Relational Phenomena and Understanding Entities. This gradual expansion of our understanding of the senses, their functioning and interactions and the consequent changes in our understanding of experience reminds me of the problem of local, uh, localizing human consciousness. In his book entitled Out of Our Heads, Why You Are Not Your Brains and Other Lessons from the Biology of Consciousness, Alva Noe argues that scientists have not succeeded in localizing human consciousness because they have been searching it, its location in a wrong place inside the brain. In the philosopher's view, and I believe he is right, consciousness cannot be localized at all because it is not a thing, but a relational phenomenon emerging between the human mind and the world. We must confess now that all artist, artistic and poetic experiences are relational experiences and their essences, meanings and emotive characteristics arise from a dynamic interaction of human factors uh, and qualities with the human neural system and consciousness to constitute an experience. The poetic and artistic experience also always activates our deepest collective and biological memories. Our experiences resonate with our personal and human histories. An interest in the phenomena of, uh, architect, uh, of atmospheres, ambiances, feelings, moods, and attunements as well as in the understanding of the real multisensory and simultaneous nature of perception is emerging. This new interest in experience is shifting research from form and formal structures to emotive and dynamic experiences and mental processes and from form to processes of becoming. It is evident that when the focus shifts from the physical reality and form to the mental reality and emotion, also the methodology of the study is bound to change. In the study of the ex experiential essence of art and architecture, relevant philosophical perspectives, as well as an understanding and intuiting of perceptual and mental phenomena, memory and imagination are called for. 
in order to understand human experience, we must shift from the quasi-scientific processes of measuring to the courage and desire to confront uh, live, uh, live architecture directly through our very act of living. Thank you. I'll gladly answer any, any questions if you, the audience has questions. Yes, we thank Professor, uh, we thank Mr. Palazma for his great speech, and we are looking for any questions. Yes, we have one question in the Q&A section. Uh, do you want me to read? Yeah, please. Uh, thank you very much for your very inspiring speech, dear Mr. Palazma. You mentioned architecture should confront life and feel rather than understood of formalized intellectuality. Do you have any suggestions for new researchers who study existential experience in architecture? How can they handle research on that subject? Thank you. Well, as I made clear in my lecture, I have become suspicious of uh, uh, excessive in intellectualization and verbalization. And uh, as I said, I have uh, studied uh, and written uh, for 60 years. And it, it is rather dramatic uh, to find out that, that one has been looking at the wrong things. Uh, it has taken me, I had my 85th birthday uh, just a few days ago, it has taken me so long to, uh, to understand that I can, I can uh, grasp the world through my own, uh, own existence, simply by uh, sensing my own being instead of uh, you know intellectualizing things in, and conceptualizing things and uh, i think this is the way all genuine artists work in any way they uh, work on the basis of the, the their um, uh, how embodied uh, intuition and and the concealed wisdom that we have in our bodies and being. So I'm suggesting that architects or anyone who wants to move towards this kind of thinking and working in architecture would eventually build a, a, a trust, a confidence in their own judgment and perceptions. We have uh, two more questions, uh, one from Aysun Aydin. Uh, she says, first of all, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and honoring our Congress. My question is, has the spirit of architecture died with the modern world? Or has the human being who defines the spirit become soulless? Or is the spirit the act itself? Can you repeat it? That there was something wrong with the sound. She, she was asked, an echo. Okay, I'm, I'm repeating yeah. again. She asked, yeah. has the spirit of architecture died with the modern world or has the human being who defines the spirit become soulless or is the spirit the act itself? Well, we are living in an era of uh, quasi-rationality and uh, obsessive, uh, sick materiality. Uh, 
And uh, as far as architecture is concerned, we have lost uh, our own understanding of architecture as an art form. And we have accepted it as a uh, e uh, techno-economic service profession as engineers and lawyers. Uh, I am very uh, sad about the current situation of architecture. And by my own activities and writing and lecturing, I, uh, I hope to have some, uh, some role in uh, supporting a humanistic uh, thinking, which would eventually, could eventually uh, br bring architecture back to, to an art form, respected art form, which has a poetic meaning uh, more than a uh, techno-economic meaning. Uh, Asubeshkan wrote, uh, thank you very much for being with us. Keep safe and long live dear Plasma. My question is, over which concepts can you define other within all these queries? Again, I didn't understand. Can you repeat? Uh, she asked, she asked uh, over which concepts can you define other within all these queries? Well, for me, uh, the notion of uh, existential existence has become so important. Of course, existentialism was a uh, philosophical and, and literary orientation. Uh, and uh, existentialism is, was represented by thinkers and uh, artists like, uh, like um, uh, this is happens to me every now and then when I'm speaking that my memory uh, fails me. Um, Jean-Paul Sartre, of course. Uh, I, I think that we have very much lost our interest and, and confidence in uh, our natural uh, gift to uh, place ourselves uh, ourselves in relation with the world. And I, I think that we need to need to uh, go back to that uh, kind of an innocent innocent attitude uh, instead of, intellectualizing, uh, trying to intellectualize everything. And then, as I said, ending up in quasi-intellectuality, so-called intellectuality, which is <laughs> not really real understanding. I guess the uh, person who asked the first question uh, wrote, uh, happy birthday and thank you for your answer. We didn't know it was your birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. I guess there is no more. Oh, one more. Just recently came. Uh, Serkan, Hatipol, Serkan Hatipolo wrote that, uh, thanks for the presentation in the pandemic period. We are surrounded much more focused vision instead of peripheral vision. Following the Zoom meetings, etc., I feel lost my atmospheric sense and mood regarding the space. How can we trigger ourselves and people in different spaces at the same screen to experience peripheral vision? Well, I must say that I I, I feel very irritated with uh, these uh, online connections simply because they are humanly so uh, unreal. It was discovered uh, already in the 60s by uh, psychologists that 80%, more than 80% of in human converse, con uh, communication 
uh, is nonverbal. We con communicate through our bodies, through our through through our presence next uh, uh, next to each other. I have uh, sometimes said that I, when I studied architecture, I learned more from my professors watching how they walked in the co corridors of the university than listening to their lectures. And I'm I'm here not underestimating at all their uh, uh, intellectual capacities. I'm just uh, trying to give an example how important physical presence is. And uh, that's almost completely lost uh, with, the, with the online connection. We have one more from Nils, Nilsu Altunok. She says, thank you for your speech. It was so thought provoking. I have questions that I wonder about the emerging of phenomenology and its current position in architectural theory. Can we say that phenomenology emerged with the failure of formalism, rationalism, or functionalism to create living environments and the discovery of place instead of abstract space? When we consider the impact of phenomenology on subsequent approaches and the theories, we see it in feminist critical theories that try to understand architecture through human experience. Do you think phenomenology has left its place to post-structuralist, deconstructivist, or feminist critical theories? Yes, well, I, I agree with those points. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, although I speak about phenomenology and I understand myself that I uh, approach things in a phenomenological sense, I don't project or impose uh, pre-thought concepts uh, or views on on things that I that I. Uh, observe or consider, I let the phenomena to to uh, open up and present themselves to my consciousness. That's the basic phenomenological attitude. Uh, yes, um, I'm I'm not suggesting phenomenology as a kind of a medicine or or a uh, the only right, uh, proper way of thinking for me, uh, and I, I want to add that I have never studied philosophy. I'm basically a, a farm boy. I grew up uh, on my grandfather's small farm in central Finland during the war years. So I have often said that I, I practice a farm boy's phenomenology. Uh, simply going back to the innocence of my childhood when I was uh, by myself and had nothing else to do than uh, watch uh, plants and animals behave uh, in nature. So that's, I learned my phenomenology uh, in my uh, farm life as a, as a young boy. <laughs> But I, I would say that the uh, profession or practice of farming and fishing, they are both uh, pure phenomenological situations. <laughs> Phenomenology is not only a manner of, of uh, formulating philosophical thought, it's also a manner of, uh, of uh, placing yourself in relation to the things you are working with. <laughs> that was a great answer. And I think we don't have any more questions. Uh, we have one. Uh, we have also Beshkan. No. Someone was raising hand, but it just disappeared. I guess there's no more questions. 
Okay then. Uh, you, uh, we, we are happy to have you with us today uh, in our conference. Uh, we thank you again, and we would like to see you again in the future conferences. And uh, good evening for this time. Thank for you. Now. <laughs> I will go now by boat to a little island with uh, our children to uh, uh, have my birthday party because oh. I was in the wilderness of Lapland and Arctic Ocean uh, during my birthday. <laughs> uh, that would be a great night then. Happy birthday again. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Oh, one more question. No, it's just a statement. Also, Beshkan says happy birthday. <laughs> and I, I guess we are done. Uh, uh, and I would like to uh, inform that our closing ceremony uh, will be live in a minute. Uh, we will see you in there. Thank you, Mr. Palazme, again. Good Thank evening. You. Thank you for inviting me.